Hello and welcome from the First United Methodist Church in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. As I speak, thousands of miles away, five time zones, people are lined up for miles, literally miles, to view the casket containing the body of Queen Elizabeth II. It's an odd practice, isn't it? Simply to go and see, not even the casket, but see the flag that covers it. And know that inside is the body of someone who has meant a lot to a lot of people. This room where I'm sitting now, is the church parlor, the, the lounge. It's where we hold our coffee hour. It's where people mix and mingle after church. It's where um, sometimes people will just sit and talk if they need a quiet place. And it's a, a room where occasionally, very occasionally, um, you'll see that someone has come in in the afternoon and, and is taking a little bit of a nap. It's also the room where when we have a funeral, we hold a viewing. And just like happens in London on, with the death of, of the Queen, here on a much smaller scale, people come by and they pay their respects. They greet the family, but they pay their respects to someone who has died. Now, that person's soul is with God. Their life has left the body. But we still respect the remains and treat them with honor. It's because we recognize that we are bodies and souls together. The way the soul moves through the world is with the help of this body of ours. And the way that the body moves and, and experiences things is motivated by the soul that is within. And we don't pretend to understand all of this. But we do read in the scriptures that at the end of time, and there will be an end to time as there is a beginning to time, God will make everything and remake everything and bring it to a sort of fulfillment. And the scriptures speak of bodies being restored. When we look at Jesus' resurrection, we see that as the beginning of something the promise of a life that is put back together. Because the way we know one another is through recognizing one another's faces, voices, mannerisms. Those are things we know through the body. The things that we recognize about someone their kindness, their intelligence, their uh, wit, their love. Those are things that come from the soul. But we need a body to express them. And so we honor. And, and, and 
work for the care of bodily things. Health care. Warmth. In the winter, people need to be kept warm. Decent jobs, because people need to be able to feed themselves and feed their families. Housing. All of these are physical needs. And when we seek to secure them for ourselves and for others, and a just distribution of all that makes that possible. It's part of honoring God's creation and honoring God. Next time you go to a viewing, think about these things and pay your respect. Sorry if it seems a little morbid, but it's not really. It's not about dying. It's about living. And let's now worship the God who gives us life. This week we hear from the 16th chapter of Luke, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill, make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light. And, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone they may welcome you into eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have been faithful with the dishonest wealth, excuse me, if then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The parable of the dishonest manager, or the dishonest steward, as I want to always call it, um, this parable is one that 
bugs me. <laughs> and, and the reason is that as you read through it, it sounds like Jesus is commending a crook for his attempt to protect his future now that he's been caught and to do it by drawing other people into his schemes and implicating them as well so that as the investigation gets closer and closer to him he will have people sort of buffering the situation a little bit he knows he's caught He's already been told by the property's owner that he can no longer be his property manager. He can no longer handle his business. He's going to be fired. But on your way out the door, I want an accounting because I want to know how much you stole. And this guy is trying to find ways to as I say, buffer the situation. Does it sound familiar at all? Have you ever heard of this kind of a, a situation coming up? Have you ever imagined that someone would make things worse than their original crime by trying, as we would say, to obstruct justice? And then, in that type of a situation, Jesus says that the man's master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age, he said, are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. Jesus looks at this guy and he describes what he's doing. And yes, it's a parable. This is Jesus' story. He didn't have, at least that we know of, any particular person in mind. And if perhaps you have someone in mind, or if I did, hypothetically, it would get us all riled up. I think Jesus intended that. And once we're riled up, he moves in on us, Jesus, and says, listen, if this guy can do this stuff, why can't you be at least, at least as creative in a good way, in a good way, as, as this other one, this dishonest manager. It isn't really that the crime itself is being applauded. It is not. In the parable, he's being fired, and that's going to happen. But he had acted shrewdly. He had, he had been able to look and be creative and to think on his feet, to see what was coming, to, to look at what lay ahead and to provide for a changing landscape. And all of those are attributes that in and of themselves, when used properly, are praiseworthy and admirable. And if only, says Jesus, if only his disciples would be as shrewd, as canny, as this crook over here. You know, for a while, I kept a file of emails that I called funny attempts until I stopped adding to it because the file became ridiculously overloaded. And, and truth to tell, a lot of what I was getting came to be repetitive. 
But I want to share with you one of my favorites uh, because it embodies and it includes a lot of the different themes that, that show up in these emails. Now, there are a few that are missing. There's no oil, there's no gold bullion, there are no packages being held in the Atlanta airport, but you can't honestly get everything into one email. And um, as I speak and as I try to read this, you won't get the full effect because you're missing the bad spelling and the awful punctuation. Some of the, the bad grammar will come through. And how can you resist an email that comes through with a message titled, Hello, my beloved? Which is what this one did. And the body of it said this. This is Ms. Josan Nowak from Estonia, writing from hospital here in Ivory Coast. Therefore, this email is very urgent to attend. I want you to know that I'm dying here in this hospital right now, which I don't know if I will see more days to come. My beloved, I was informed by my doctor that I got poisoned and it affected my liver and I can only live for some days. The reason why I contacted you today is because I know that my stepmother want to kill me and take my inheritance from my late father. I have a little adopted child named Eric C. Nowak that I adopted in this country when my late father was alive. And three, I think it's 3.5, she uses a comma instead of a period, so I'll say 3.5. And $3.5 million I inherited from my late father. My stepmother and her children, they are after Eric right now because they found out that Eric was aware of the poison and because I handed the documents of the fund over to him the day my stepmother poisoned my food. For that reason, they do not want Eric to expose them, so they are doing everything possible to kill him. Presumably right now, she's so upset that she's coughing. <coughs> she's wheezing maybe because she's been so excited that all the lungs, the air is out of her lungs or because of the poison. Maybe she's just kind of um, grabbing her, her abdomen in pain because of the, the, the twisted, uh, everything that the poison is doing to her inside. Um, but she finds the strength to go on and write. My beloved, please, I want you to help him out of this country with the money. He is the only one taking care of me here in this hospital right now. And even this email you are reading now, he is the one helping me out. So maybe the bad spelling is his, not hers. Okay, let me go on. I want you to get back to me so that he will give you the documents of the fund and he will direct you to a well-known lawyer that I have appointed. The lawyer will assist you to change the documents of the fund to your name to enable the bank transfer the money to you, period, period, two periods. This is the favor I need when you have gotten the fund. One, keep 40% of the money for Eric until he finish his studies to become a man as he has been there for me as my lovely son. And I promise to support him in life to become a medical doctor because he always desire for it with the scholarship he had won so far. I want you to take him along with you to your country and establish him as your son. Give 20% of the money to handicapped people. I'm not sure if that's um, a verb there, that you're supposed to use this to handicap people, um, to make, you know, to trip them up, to, um, uh, I, I think she means handicapped. Anyway, 
uh, give 20% of the money to handicapped people and charity organization. The remaining 40% should be yours for helping my son, Eric, on this task. Note, with semicolon. This should be a code between you and my son, Eric, in this transaction. Dash, open parentheses, code, colon, hospital, close parentheses, period. Any mail from him, the lawyer he will direct you to without this code, dash, open parenthesis, code, colon, hospital, close parenthesis, period, is not from Eric, the lawyer, or myself, as I don't know what will happen to me in the next few hours. Finally, write me back urgent so that Eric will send you his pictures to be sure of whom you are dealing with. Eric is 14 years of age, therefore guide him. Again, if I don't hear from you, I will look for another person or any organization. May Almighty God bless you and use you to accomplish my wish. Pray for me always. Ms. Josan Nowak. That was sent in 2018. So I assume she's long dead by now. And I can only hope that poor Eric also escaped somehow from being poisoned like her. That somewhere someone is using 40% of the money, or 20% rather, to help handicapped people and charity organizations. I don't think so, though. Ah, what a waste it is. What a waste it is writing something like that. And, and with the ability to do it in a language that is obviously not your mother tongue. And, and to put all of that effort into an email that most people probably deleted. Oh, I'm assuming it wasn't just sent to me. I think that's a safe assumption. When, you know, if that same effort had gone into um, writing a novel, I mean, really, a couple novels, there's enough there to do that. You can fill in the backstory of Ms. Josan Nowak and how she came fleeing from Estonia after escaping from her stepmother and, 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 and arrived in the Ivory Coast to join her dying father. And, and he gives her this $3.5 million that she is to use in whatever way. But somewhere along the way, she also met her, her deceased husband. And, and, and what was the story of, of little Eric? What happened to his family that he became an orphan? Um, had he survived some of the wars in West Africa? And, and if so, how did he come to be befriended by the Nowaks? And, and what was going to happen to him in a sort of David Copperfield kind of a way in the future? Would he grow up to become a medical doctor? Would he have developed a vaccine in the next four years after this 2018 note and, and, and have saved an entire nation from a terrible disease that was coming to ravage it? And what about the poisoner? What happens to that person? How did they reach that spot? And, and, and what happened to them after, afterward? Were they caught? Or did justice catch up with them? As it catches up with all 
evildoers and grifters. If only, if only, if only, if only the creativity that goes into something like that would be put to use for good. If only the children of light were as shrewd in dealing with the, the people of their own generation as the people that do this stuff. Creativity builds on creativity. An imagination put to good purpose opens up the doorway into even better things. It isn't just that the bad things open up into bad things, but good things can open up into good things. When the imagination of Jesus' disciples is put clearly and freely into God's hands, good things happen. In the four years since this thing was written, we've gone through a lot of things. And, you know, it's a beautiful sight to see how the good things that have happened in the midst of trouble have continued and have grown and done more good and opened the doorway into more good. When we here at this church needed to find a way to stay safe while continuing to help our neighbors whose financial stability was threatened during the shutdown. At that point, the kitchen ministry began doing drive through meals so that people would be able to get past their own financial straits, which, which didn't last long, but were real, and in some cases have continued. But for the most part, what happened was that, that they began to offer drive through meals. They were handing them out before, and had been for years before, in conjunction with a couple of other churches, but we needed to do things in a new way. And when it became safe enough, they looked at their further needs and said, it isn't just the food that people need, they need to be able to talk to one another. And it was just becoming safe at that point for people to do what we did, to put tables outside and say, if you want to eat the food that we're sharing with you right now, and eat it here and sit and talk, please do. Not everybody was ready for that, but, but the tables were there. And, and when it became safer, we, and it got colder and we had to do it, we moved the tables indoors and, and said, come, sit, eat. If you're feeling okay with it, sit and eat and meet your friends. Sit with us. We can listen. And that's what we have done. And, and to the point now where people make reservations and they, they call their friends and they say, hey, you know, next month we'll be there, will you? And it's beautiful to see. Um, and, and in the midst of that, we got used to handing things out. And, and after Bible school, which we held outdoors, uh, there were some leftover craft materials, and, and it came about to say, well, why don't we take the leftover lesson sheets and, and craft materials, and we'll make up bags of those. And so the people coming to pick up a meal, if they had children in the house or grandchildren or somebody like that, could take a lesson and a craft. Sunday school in a bag. And they began to do that. We've continued to do that. Do we know 
exactly who's getting them? Do we know how far the reach is? No, we don't. It may be going nowhere. On the other hand, it may be going all sorts of places. But we're called to be as shrewd as we possibly can be in a good way. To understand and, and to deal with the situations that we're handed in ways that are effective. Because Jesus said, whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And as time goes on, we're going to have to be creative in a lot of different ways. Some of them will work and some of them won't. But bless whoever reaches with their imagination to take the gospel to people. That's what Jesus is saying. And as for the several thousand Nigerian bank managers and retired military officers from Dubai, stock executives in Bangkok, recently converted former government officials in Cote d'Ivoire, surviving relatives of platinum mine owners, representatives of ancient law firms in London who have noticed that your last name is the same as one of their clients. All people who have reached out, not only to their own communities, but to people across the globe, throughout the interwebs. Whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. And if then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In other words, Ms. Nowak, wherever you are, you need to get another gig. And at the very least, get yourself a proofreader. As both our prayer and our benediction today, hear these words, a hymn written by Julian Rush. In the midst of new dimensions, in the face of changing ways, who will lead the pilgrim peoples wandering in their separate ways? God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey now and evermore. Through the flood of starving peoples, warring factions and despair, who will lift the olive branches? Who will light the flame of care? God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey, now and evermore. As we stand, a world divided by our own self-seeking schemes, grant that we, your global village, might envision wider dreams. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey, now and evermore. We are man and we are woman, all persuasions, old and young, each a gift in your creation, each a love song to be sung. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey, now and evermore. Should the threats of dire predictions cause us to withdraw in pain, may your blazing phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar, we, your people, ours the journey now and ever.
now and ever, now and evermore. Amen.